In 1971, David Scott, the commander of Apollo 50 on the surface of the moon, and demonstrated, as predicted by Galileo, that in a vacuum, a hammer and a feather fall at the same speed. He proved that physics is relative. Now, this was uh, good news for Galileo. Um, it was also pretty good news for David Scott, because if you're standing on the surface of the moon, and you're relying on the laws of physics to get you back to the Earth again, that would be a really awkward moment to discover that the laws of physics don't work. Now, a, a NASA astronaut uh, proving the theory of a 17th century uh, Italian physicist um, is, is one of the great examples of global collaboration um, within science. But of course, science has always been a global collaborative endeavor. One of the things that has changed has been the language of uh, Galileo, for example, um, from Italy. Uh, Kepler was from Germany. Descartes was from France. Newton was from England. But all of these people wrote most of their key work in Latin. If we jump forward to the 21st century, the, the language of science is English. But English today is even more important than Latin was 400 years ago, because science has become significantly more collaborative. Uh, a 2011 report from the Royal Society on Knowledge, Network, and Nations uh, paints a picture of an increasingly multipolar scientific world. Um, the authors highlight the growing importance of informal connections. And they say that maintained by the bottom-up exchange of scientific insights, knowledge, and skills, they are changing the focus of science from the national to the global level. But of course, science uh, and communication does not always move the needle. Now, this is a story that was told to me by uh, Dr. Julie Robinson, who's uh, NASA's uh, chief scientist at the International Space Station, and whom I was very fortunate to get an interview. Now, the International Space Station is one of the most uh, amazing success stories um, within the world of science collaboration. Um, we can see here um, a, uh, a, a, an astronaut from NASA, uh, astronaut from JAXA, Professor from JAXA at the NASA Space Station. Now, Dr. Robinson told me a story um, of when JAXA came to NASA and asked if NASA would like to collaborate on a piece of equipment for the International Space Station. They sent some diagrams and some some specifications. Now NASA thought that JAXA could collaborate on a building project. They went back with some questions and a discussion began. But at one point in the discussion, NASA suddenly realized that JAXA weren't asking for help on a building project. They'd already built it. They were asking if NASA wanted to collaborate on a movement. The thing is, says Dr. Robinson, the discussion had been going on for two years before anyone realized it. Now, of course, cross-border communication is difficult at the best of times. But here's a question that's particularly important when we're thinking about cross-border communication within science. How good are scientists at communication in general? Now, this is the, uh, one of the questions that was uh, considered um, as part of a 2011 study for the UK government um, into STEM graduates, that is, graduates from the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Well, what did the study find? The authors concluded that some STEM graduates lacked some of the broader behavioral skills sought of graduates, such as particular teamwork, The authors also found that this was more so at PhD level. Now, of course, the authors could have saved themselves a lot of time and a lot of effort um, simply by watching a couple of episodes of the Big Bang Theory. Uh, but the serious point is that these researchers were studying native English speakers working in the UK. And of course, things get considerably more complex when English is a foreign language. 
which leads us to the question, what are some of the things we can do to improve uh, cross-border communication or English language within science? Well, one of the things we can do um, is to get scientists to help us, um, in particular, neuroscience. Um, Neuro-ELT is part of the Society for the Mind and Brain and Education. Um, and it asks, what can English language teachers learn from the work of neuroscience and psychology? Now, one of the most fascinating discoveries in this area has been to do with the role of emotion in the brain. Um, as Mary Helen Imodino Wang and many others have noticed, we used to think that emotion was separate from or interfered with the learning process, but we now know that that's not true. In organisms, emotion plays a critical role in all of our higher level thinking and learning. Uh, emotion has been compared to the rudder of a ship. We can't really see it, but it's always there guiding our behavior and our decision making. It doesn't just uh, come into play when we're standing on the edge of a cliff or when we're falling in love. Emotion is there all the time in all of our in all of our learning processes. Now, when it comes to teaching and learning, one of the big takeaways from all of this is the importance of finding ways of creating emotional connections with what we study. And of course, there are many ways to do this. I'm going to briefly mention one that I've had particular success with within a global science context, and that is bringing uh, people from different countries together over Skype to do reviews of movie scripts. Now, our brains love stories. Humans have evolved to become storytelling animals. Stories have a special power for us. Now, taking part in a story, uh, playing the part of a character in a movie, interacting with people in different countries, doing a review of a movie script in English with other non-native speakers from around the world. And this can be a highly effective way of, of really harnessing that power. Plus, if it's a good science fiction movie that respects science and that respects technology, then the emotional connection with the language, and therefore the potential for developing language communication skills, um, is enhanced even more. Um, now, I've been fortunate to have had uh, support on this project from uh, Start Motion Pitch, um, who gave me the script for Europa Report, which is a wonderfully um, tense and uh, realistic movie about an international mission in search for evidence of the Europa Project or the Galileo Mission. Um, I've also had um, great support from Bombay Sapphire, who gave me the script for one of the short movies in their Imagination series. Um, Exit Road is a, is a brilliant eight-minute science fiction movie um, with just two characters. Um, it not only has wonderful dialogue. It also has a brilliant puzzle solving that really makes you think. On a side note, um, Exit Log also does for Beethoven what 2001 does for Strauss. Um, well, overall, the key message of all of this is that English language teaching within a scientific domain can present particular challenges. And so we may need to think particularly carefully about the best ways to create emotional connection with the language that we study in and therefore achieve better learning outcomes. But of course, it's not just scientists who have problems with language learning. Um, we all do, even people who work with language as a profession. Um, I'd like to end my sort of mini webinar here um, by returning to the moon, um, where the astronauts uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin left a plaque on the surface of the moon. Um, it was assigned by them, by Michael Pollan, the commander of Mission Apollo, um, and also the US President, Richard Nixon. The words were written by William Safran, um, a speechwriter for President Nixon. Here, men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, 1980. We came in peace for all men. Unfortunately, the plaque does contain William Sapphire later said, I, presuming to be a word maker, have been sternly informed that AD must always precede and never follow AM. My guilt is on the grand scale. I helped to create the first sign to be placed by Earth on another celestial body, and it contains a glaring grammatical error. Thank you.
Spinners. 